to counter your question about awareness, I would take you to the realm of intention for us to start asking ourselves the questions of what am I doing? What is my intention with my attention? Mm. <laughs> I only said that for the Instagram clip. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, and clip. All right, great. Now tell us more about that. <sighs> Hello, my friend. Welcome back into another episode of A Level Deeper. Thank you for being here with me again. We've got an action-packed episode to listen to and unpack together today. I wanted to invite my friend Nate Langley back onto the show to talk about, you know, in the first episode, if you haven't listened to it, my first episode with Nate was actually the first episode of this podcast. We talked about some of Nate's healing journey that he had been on. And as Nate points out at the end of this episode, it had a much different tone and energy to the conversation. Today's conversation with Nate was a blast. First of all, we recorded it in person together, sitting in front of Cathedral Rock in Sedona, Arizona, in front of the Red Rocks, and just this unbelievable landscape. We talk about it a little bit to start the show, but it was incredible to be in nature filming a conversation together. Just It felt, it felt right, it really felt right. Now, because of that, that introduced a few natural elements as well. Like, for example, they're going to hear some wind noise in this episode. You might hear some birds, a plane flying overhead. At one moment, someone was mountain biking. A group of five or six people came by, and someone just completely fell off their mountain bike about 10 feet in front of us. And so that happens in this episode. It is really action-packed. I mean, every opportunity I get to invest time with Nate, whether it's just sitting face-to-face with no cameras around or on a podcast... Our conversations are always filled with all kinds of gold nuggets and perspectives on life. Today, in particular, we had some fun conversation about, you know, this process of making big decisions in life and from our experience, how there's a very certain formula of when you make these decisions and then you employ them, like Nate's decision to move out to Sedona from Michigan. We're finding common experiences that you go through and that it's not always smooth sailing once you make that decision. We unpack some of that, and I think you're going to enjoy hearing our perspective on these decisions because it just makes it relatable that, you know, it's not all, it's not all an easy path when you try to do things differently in life. Since I last recorded with Nate, he has become a coach and we talk about some of the themes that Nate runs into most in his coaching work. I happen to be one of his coaching clients. So it's fun to hear what else he's talking about with some of his other clients One thing that stood out to me was this idea of people being focused on what they want to achieve instead of who they want to become. And we talk about why that might be the wrong way of looking at things. Maybe you've heard me talk about it before on the show, but Nate and I unpack this idea of operating systems. It's this metaphor that he and I use to describe the ways in which we think and believe and operate and what the process is like to make updates to those operating systems. And we've got some ways... And we've got some opportunities for you to think about your own operating system and what updates you might need to make. Lastly, just a week or two ago, Nate led me and my wife, Eileen, and some of our friends through a breathwork ceremony. He recently became a certified breathwork facilitator. We talk about that experience and the power of the breath, and we go about it in a very relatable way. Nate has this way of inviting people into the things that he does. So whether you're familiar with breathwork or not, My hope is that you can take away something from this conversation and maybe become something that you're interested in trying. If you're listening to this conversation, I also have a YouTube version. And, you know, even if you don't watch the full thing on YouTube, but I definitely recommend going and checking out the scenery that was behind us during this conversation because it's absolutely incredible. All right, my friend, without further ado, I'm going to hand the mic back to uh, me and the Red Rocks with Nate. And here's our conversation. This is going to be a silent podcast where it's just me and you with our eyes closed with the sun hitting us. <sighs> it sounds like it'd be a nice show. Yeah. All right. Bring people into, you're, you're the local, so bring people into where we are seated right now. Oh my goodness. I'm so excited about the, I came on your podcast before and I was just sitting in my living room on, a, I think a rainy day and you were somewhere in your van. Now we're together. We are in, I mean, in the Red Rocks of Sedona. So you and I are sitting right next to each other. Behind us is Cathedral Rock, framed beautifully right between us. And just below us here is the wonderful, clear, flowing Oak Creek. So like 
the sun might be a little bright on my face right now, but I definitely, I'll take the trade off. You're going to have your eyes closed for this whole conversation. I, I, I might, but I still, I've been around enough that I know where, where I'm at. So I don't, I don't need the, the visuals as much, but it is so pretty and the temperature's perfect and the birds are chirping. Wow. Drones are flying. Sometimes you might hear an airplane. <laughs> you might hear an airplane. You might hear some wind. You might hear some birds, but the, uh, the ability to be able to film a conversation out here. I, I told Dave, you know, this is, this is a lot of why I, I guess wanted to start the podcast in the first place and why I've recently invested more into getting equipment that allows me to go in person with people is because number one, I want to be able to have these conversations face to face. I just think you can't replace that sitting across or next to or adjacent from someone and having a conversation with them. And number two, uh, being able to go the places that my lifestyle and living in this van allows me to go. And so to film I mean, if, if you're listening to this, you need to, at some point, go on either my Instagram or Nate's Instagram. We'll have them linked in the show or, or head to YouTube because y- you need to see what we're talking about. But anyway, it's an absolutely stunning setting for a conversation. The colors are just popping right now. It's just, you know, it's spring here. So everything is, people think of the desert and they think of, you know, the browns and the grays and, you know, like the, the washed out from all the heat. It is the opposite right now. All the orange colors on the rocks are popping and then the green just contrasting off of it is so incredible. Like as I'm speaking, I'm looking out at all the trees of Oak Creek and they're all bright green and just glowing in the sun. Man, this is great. <laughs> you live here. Yeah. Has that, uh, has that really like settled in? Because it's been what, two or two three years, years now. And, but you live here. This is, this is your home. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. I think that it's one of those things where it has settled in, but also it's something I have to continually remind myself of as I'm thinking about trying to get to the next place. And I don't even mean it from like a living standpoint. I just mean, you know, we get distracted by the next phase of my personal development or a business thing I want to do or a vacation I want to go on. It's like, wait, I'm, we just along the path that we're sitting by. A couple from Toronto just came by because they're staying here and they're on their vacation. It's like their dream vacation. So I, I've definitely in the past six months or so really tried to stay in that feeling of, oh man, like I'm in such a beautiful environment. My body feels good. My mind feels good. My heart feels full. And it's getting easier and easier the, the more that I kind of do that as a practice, I guess. Yeah, I think we we talked about you know, the, the idea of, and I'm trying to think back to our, our first conversation. You might need to fill people in, you know, the, the listener who's in their car right now or yeah. on a walk, fill them in on, you know, what, what brought you out here in the first place? I'm not sure we covered that in our first conversation. Yeah. The first conversation we started, you just said, Hey, uh, the way I'm experiencing you now is much different than I did a few years ago due to this illness that I, that I had. And, um, so for whoever didn't watch the first episode or listen, uh, I had this issue with mold toxicity that really took a lot out of me. I spent between 2020 and 2022 just focusing on recovering in every sense of the world. It, it, it hit me mentally, physically, emotionally, all that stuff. So um, as I was getting a bit better, I started to really try to envision, uh, I should also mention professionally, our, our gyms that I, I used to work at, Applied Fitness, those also had a major setback during COVID. So by the time 2022 came around, Two of our gyms had closed. I was working myself back into health, almost as if I had this second chance in life in a way. And I started envisioning, well, what what do I want this next stage to look like? And one of the images that kept coming in, and it might sound superficial, but it was just mountains. (laughs) I don't know why. Renee and I, my fiance, have spent a lot of time in nature and going to all these different places. And there's just something about being in the mountains, being out west that really felt it felt like home to us. It felt like it was calling us. So I was doing a lot of, uh, manifestation meditation, or, you know, if you don't get down with that kind of stuff and it sounds woo woo, I was just thinking about it a lot. (laughs) You know what I mean? (laughs) So I ended up getting this opportunity to come out here for a job interview for this company that uses videos. So I I do video work, Chad, and I have a very similar skill set. Um, 
to they use videos to sell vacant lands and their HQ was in Sedona, Arizona. And when the the owner of that company who was talking to me on the phone was telling me this in my driveway back in Michigan, uh, he goes, I was like, yeah, where's your HQ? Because on their website, it said Texas. And he's got this really, he's got like a Southern drawl to him. He goes, we're in Sedona, Arizona. <laughs> and the way he said it was so <laughs> alluring that I'm like, dang, I got to go check out Sedona, Arizona. And the moment Had we got- Had you been out here before? No, no. Okay. I had never even been, I don't think I'd even been to Arizona before. Okay. So it was a very new thing. Came out for the interview. As soon as we did like our first hike in Sedona, Renee came with me, by the way. Uh, she goes, we're moving here. Like she just decided for us almost like this is the next, this is, I feel it. This is the next thing. I had a lot of fear around that just because I have family and all these ties back home, a lot of community there. And that was really a big catalyst for my next phase of growth was being willing to move away from that and come out here and kind of start from scratch in that regard. So that, that's how I got here. What was it that pushed you over the edge to make that decision? Aside from Renee saying, all right, we're, we're coming out here. You know, that's, that's, it's difficult. I mean, at times Eileen and I have thought about, do we want to potentially settle somewhere other than Michigan, where our home base is, where our families are, where a majority of our friends are, to pick up and to go somewhere new? What led to that decision? A lot of reflection. And it was, it was around this concept that you and I end up talking about when we're not on camera and mic about the unknown. And I have all these aspirations for myself and who I feel deep down I can become. And I kept thinking about, okay, if those are real and those are true to you, will your current life experience that you're existing in right now in Michigan, is there a pathway for, your, for you to extract him? And the more I thought of it from that perspective, I was like, I don't think there is. There's too much comfort and there's too much known. I'll just stick to the, I'll, I'll end up adhering too much to the comfort stuff and I probably won't push into the unknown. So I had to really, and it's not like I had one moment where I said, the unknown's great. <laughs> like it was still really, really scary, but that was the, that was the sort of thought process was, well, what are you going to need to bring out that next version of you if you really feel he's in there? And it was, oh, you need to go into the unknown. Like there could be things out there that are going to catalyze this next path that you would never get onto if you stay here in Michigan. What about your relationship? How has your relationship to the unknown since that point? How has it changed? How has it evolved? You, you step into this experience. You say, all right, we're going to move out to Sedona. That's a very unknown situation. We're now a couple of years removed from that decision. <laughs> You've subsequently stepped into multiple new unknowns. <laughs> yeah. I'm sure We'll talk about in this conversation. Yeah. But what is your relationship to the unknown like as we sit here today? It, it, it's, I'm getting to understand the unfolding or the, or the pattern that happens when you do something that is new and different. And, that, and it usually goes something like this. Uh, one, I have this awareness that I'm supposed to move in that direction and I'm afraid to. So I don't do anything for a while. And then I keep getting reminded that not doing anything is not serving me. So it keeps pinging me. So then I decide to take the action. Now, this is where in the movies, you always see like, ah, once that moment happens, the person's life turns around, the music comes on. No, the next thing after the action is like this hangover, this um, pause button gets pressed where you really got to sit in your decision and wonder, was it the right one? And it's been happening over and over. So the first six months I spent in Sedona, I was by myself. Renee was back in Michigan trying to get our, all of our stuff sold, uh, like the condo we were living in and, you know, get all that taken care of. So I'm out here alone, had some adverse experiences with the work I was doing. Uh, the, the energy of Sedona is a real thing. So it was also shoving into my foreground things that were still like unhealed in my being. I'm out here for that six months going, did I just screw up big time? Am I going to like, is Renee going to get here and be all excited to move in? And I'm going to be like, let's turn around and go the other way. So there's that phase, which is really, really tough. But then I've stuck into it long enough to then see, ah, if you can make it through that muddy portion, take, for, take that for what it is, then little things start to happen that sort of nod to you from the universe like, ha, you're on the right track here. You meet a person. 
or you get invited to a thing or an opportunity arises and you just start going, yes, yes to this, yes to this. And the, the feeling you had a long time ago about your change starts to become more of a vision. It starts to get more clear. So I know that that was kind of an all over the place answer, but that really is what it's like, I think, to move into the unknown is it's like everything. Well, first of all, that's a very relatable answer. <laughs> you, yeah, you felt this. <laughs> Especially all the phases <laughs> of, you know, I, I think uh, people might often get a sort of misconception that it's like, oh, if, if you take these steps or you see people like someone like a Nate taking steps into the unknown, like you're just doing it with so much confidence and there's never any doubt. There's never any second thoughts. And so I say it's relatable because that's been my experience. You know, it's like, yeah, hey, let's go live in a van. Oh my gosh. Yeah. This is the greatest idea. This feels so aligned. This feels great. Then you do it. And then, you know, you get two weeks into it and there's just this, oh shit moment of like, did we just make the worst mistake of our entire lives? Yeah. But then you kind of, like you said, I guess I keep going back to this word awareness because there's, I'm thinking of that person listening and if they're like, okay, Nate, but you're mentioning that this started with some awareness that you're supposed to move out here or in order for you to become the person that you want to become, you have to make a change. You have to do something different. Can you describe what this awareness is? I, I mean, what, what is it? Yeah. I'm smiling because you're so good at very quickly, like boiling down. Well, wait, if this is going to be helpful, like what's the actual concept that people need to be able to work through as I speak, there's mountain bikers going by. This is so cool. <laughs> um, so yeah, I think it would be, we talked a lot on that last podcast and I don't want to stay there too long, but part of it is there's adverse experiences we have. There's pain that we feel that can be kind of like a warning sign or kind of like calling to us to pay more attention. And when I think about trying to answer your question in the most honest way, that's what comes to my mind is you start to actually tune in. And when you're numb, you're not going to feel any of that stuff, right? So you have to really do your best to remove any of the things that you're using to numb yourself. So this could be, oh man, things like alcohol, even, uh, I'm, I'm actually a proponent of cannabis, but that can be a number. Um, the amount of media that you are taking in the type of people you surround yourself with the type of, uh, purchases you make, even the thoughts you indulge in, you got to like start with all that and go, okay, am I distracting myself or am I trying to tune in? So like, to counter your question about awareness, I would take you to the realm of intention for us to start asking ourselves the questions of what am I doing? What is my intention with my attention? Mm. <laughs> I only said that for the Instagram clip. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> okay. Well, and clip. All right. Great. Now tell us more about that. <sighs> I've thought a lot more about it recently because... I had this illness with the mold stuff and one of the things you hear a lot in that same realm was like toxicity, toxins, environmental toxins. And uh, when you're trying to get better from it, you have to detox. You got to drink certain things, do certain practices to get some of these dense, uh, sticky, toxic substances out. And I think it's very similar for us around our vitality and our being like we have to get more intentional about how healthy our thought constructs are how healthy is our relationship with ourself i don't know I, I feel like i constantly come back to health and vitality because it feels to me like no matter where you're at in your journey if you've got some kind of health issue it's creating a like a veil over your lens of perspective. It's creating, it's coloring your perspective in a way that is going to screw up what's real. It's going to screw up like what could be real for some of the unease that's going on inside of you. So yeah, I think that boiling it down even further, it's like, I think for all of us, if we just want to see what it's like to experience ourselves at our best, health is the first thing to dive into and I know that's like a little bit of a side path from what we're talking about but that's just what's coming up for me but that helps sort of clear the way to then be able to focus more in on our intention of our attention yeah because I think everybody can resonate with just like wanting to feel good 
So if you're only, let's say you don't have any of these visions for yourself about what you can become, although I actually think that's bullshit. I think everybody has those, but let's say you don't. But I think most of us can get down with the idea of feeling 20% better than we do right now. And there's a lot of things within our realm of control that we can you know, pull levers on from a health standpoint to make that happen. Then stuff starts showing up. Then we have a, a clearer lens. We start to see the opportunity. We can hear the voice a little bit better that's telling us who we can be. So I think it starts with that simple alluring idea of how good could I feel? Like I told, told you on the last podcast, that was what led me down even figuring out what my health issue was as we went on a two-week vacation to well, now that I think of it, the American Southwest, <laughs> and I felt great. And I go, whoa, that I can feel that good. Boom. That curiosity opened up so much for me. You mentioned in the, as you were talking there, uh, well, you, you kind of, I, I saw coach Nate there for a second where, where you said, uh, you know, some people might not even have visions for themselves of what they want to be or want to become. And he said, but I think that's bullshit. Yes. <laughs> uh, that that sounds like something that that coach Nate would say. Uh, so I'm I'm kind of leading to the next thing, which is that in your journey of of coming out here, you decided that you wanted to become a coach, and I guess that just made me think of it because is that is that one of the beliefs in which would that drove you to seek coaching as a way yeah. of of you know helping people maybe tap into or understand what that vision is for themselves and make some strides towards it? Well, I only have my own experience. So me saying, I think it's bullshit doesn't mean it has to, it has to be true, but although I agree with it. Okay, good. There's, there's two of us. <laughs> if you're listening, honk your horn. <laughs> uh, call in, call in. <laughs> yeah. But do I think, ask me that question in a different way. I want to make sure that I, that I respond to this thoughtfully. Was it this idea that you believe that people do have a vision Mm. for themselves that is, let's call it, greater than what they are now? Well, first of all, Mm -hmm. would you agree with that? Is is that your belief? That that all of us have some kind of vision inside of ourselves that we are capable of doing something or being something greater than we are in this moment? Okay, yeah. So to start there, do I I think that we all have capacity for more. Um, I do. I think that as children, we're born into a world where we are basically love and light, like 99%. (laughs) And we're so open and we're, we're so caring and we're so empathetic for the most part. And then what happens is we start to have, well, one, you have to make it through the world, right? So we start to have experiences and then this other processor starts to form, which I would say is like the ego that starts trying to figure out, well, how can I help this loving, light, vulnerable creature better navigate some of the experiences that it's going to have? And it, and it, it can start to dim the light. You know, you start adding things on top of who you are that are coming from a place of navigation rather than being. And that's where it's like hard. So do I believe that we all have more and we know it? Yeah, but it might take some work of excavating some of the stuff that the world added along the way to even be able to nod and agree with the two of us saying, yeah, for sure we have it there. Hmm. So beyond that though, I think then it comes, let's, let's say that we have done some of the work and we gain an awareness that, okay, yeah, I'm start, I am hearing the voice. Uh, I, I'm, I'm feeling a call. I feel capable in this realm. Then fear comes in. And that I believe is the main thing. So like when I got a little passionate and said, it's bullshit. If you don't hear a voice, that's telling you who you can be. It's because fear will, will, will stamp out that flame so fast because we're so scared of being judged. We're so scared of failing all those different things. So we'll start to deny that we even hear the call. I mean, you could just come from a, a place of like, if you're working at a job and, and you're sitting there with your boss and they're talking about a, you know, a thing on your assembly line, you've got a good idea. Half of us will suppress the idea just because we don't want to be wrong. Like that's, that's stifling. That right there is not stepping into who you could be. Like you got to take the risk to go, Hey, you know, boss, I think if we actually 
reconfigured the belt and had uh, this item come over to here, we could save 30% or whatever, whatever it is, right? And we're doing that out of fear. Fear that we're, we're going to be wrong, fear that we're going to get judged, fear that, that we're going to make valued. a mistake. Yeah. So all the same stuff um, from our, ch- I actually think that our adult lives were basically mirroring our childhood just with different experiences. You know, so the the whole thing with the work thing could have been like the way you navigated a situation at school. Like, I think we actually adopt these patterns early on and then that just becomes us, which I actually find hilarious. And I do imagine myself a lot as like a seven-year-old having like a, you know, a really intense business conversation or even like a relationship conversation with Renee. It's like, dude, you're not that smart. You're still him. <laughs> it, it takes some <laughs> of the weight off of it. Yeah. So... You, you talked about this uh, idea of, again, I'm picturing like you as a coach are helping people maybe bring this, this excavator and, uh, and dig out some of these things mm-hmm. that are covering what people's ultimate you know, vision for themselves is. If, if they have this little feeling of, of thinking or, or feeling that they are meant for more, mm-hmm. capable of more. And then there's all these things that get layered on. We talked about, you know, maybe fear being one of the, the, the biggest things. Is that kind of the role of, of the coach is to <laughs> help back up the excavator and, or at least maybe point people where to start digging? Yeah, I, I think it's to be, definitely be sitting in, I don't know if those are two seaters or not, but to be sitting in the vehicle yeah, <laughs> that's doing the excavation <laughs> and to ask relevant questions about the excavation. So like, Man, one, like the first thing you learn when you do any, pretty much any coaching program, I think, even in, even in sports and everything is just like, okay, where do you want to go? What's in the way? That's super simple. So let's say that you ask someone, where do you want to go? And they, they kind of are thinking of it in the context of this grand thing. Like, what do you want the career to be or anything like that? Let's say they're like, I have no idea that I think they're stuck. Hang on. What do you want to feel like tomorrow? They can, they, most people can come up with an answer to that. Okay. What's in the way? Well, then if they're honest and they feel safe enough, they're going to start to share with you whatever emotional density or experiential density is there that they need to move out of the way. I always believe that that excavation comes first to create the lightness necessary to do the climbing into the next version of who we want to become. Hmm. I think a lot of us, myself included, have done the thing where we're, we're, we think that we can just keep all that stuff in our pack and go up the mountain and, and actually make it there. But, you know, you get a couple hours down the road, or in my case, you know, years and years into your life and you start having these chronic illness issues. That was because I had a lot of emotional weight inside my body that I had not properly metabolized. And that stuff needs to go before, or to open yourself up a little bit more to becoming that newer version of yourself. That's just my perspective, but I mean, if, if someone was going to interact with me in a, in a coaching sense, or even as a friend, you know, I would, that would be the perspective that I would bring to it. There's probably people that you'll find that would say, no, no, don't worry about it. Like, just focus on this thing over here. Hasn't been my experience that that works that well. I think that that thing over there is going to be a little bit insidious and always standing in the background, creating unease for the individual trying to move forward in their life. So again, just my opinion. Uh, I welcome criticism on that. <laughs> are there are there certain patterns that you've noticed people have probably heard me say before that uh i do coaching work with you so mm-hmm. you are my coach i love hearing myself on your podcast <laughs> i get so excited <laughs> so i uh, i've had the opportunity to have many sessions with you um as you work with other people i don't know are, are there certain patterns that you can kind of draw from the human experience that you're noticing that you can share with me and with someone listening to this of like you know Here's something that as I sit with multiple people, I'm noticing these certain things and maybe they can shed some light on some of our experiences we're going through life. Mm -hmm. Well, the biggest area that I find myself working in and uh, you and I talk about the chakras, but I know everybody listening might not be super like up on what what those are, Um, but it's the, the solar plexus, which comes back to a lot of the concepts around self expression. Uh, and, and also then the self-expression working its way up and actually out of us through our throat chakra, I, I end up with people who they do have a feeling that there's something more for them, 
but they have maybe a little bit of a confidence issue, you know, so that's sort of around the solar plexus. Uh, and there's a lot that goes into what might have created that lack of confidence. Or they, they're just blocked in their throat chakra and they're, they, they, maybe they're building the confidence, but they're just still not sure exactly how to express themselves and what feels true to them. So those are two major areas that I, that I spend a lot of time in. One of the reasons why is because that's where I feel I have the most to bring in real life experience. I have been the person, and in many respects I still am, who aspires to be seen, yet is scared shitless of what that means. <laughs> you know what I mean? So there's that. Another one that's really common is just uh, knowing what they don't want. So someone will come to you and just go, man, things just aren't feeling right right now, but I don't know what right looks like. Hmm. That's another one that I get a lot. What sort of a questioning would you use to help someone to figure out what right looks like? Or maybe that's not the question that you would use, but in that type of scenario, because that's, that's a very relatable feeling. I feel like that's maybe the, we talk about this idea of awareness and I'm picturing someone listening. Maybe that's the level of awareness that they have at the moment is I don't, you know, something just feels off. I'm going day to day. I'm not feeling like I'm going through life with ease or with joy. Something feels off. So what's, where's Nate directing someone in that case? Here's the first question I'll ask, and I'll do that coach thing where I ask it in like a really poignant way, and then I get quiet. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll, so if someone says that to me, and there's obviously more discovery to do, so it's not like I'm trying to solve the problem right away, but I notice that this can get a lot of good reflection They'll say something like that and I'll say, okay, so it sounds like there's a lot of things that are in your sort of periphery that aren't feeling on. Well, let me ask you this, where are you not showing up? And then the person gets real quiet for a real long time. <laughs> what I'm trying to do right away is sort of create the expectation that we have to take responsibility for our experience. It'd be very easy for me, and there's versions of me that have definitely done this, where I start trying to ask them tons and tons of questions about, okay, well, what is it about the work thing? Well, what is it about your partner? What, Dude, those people aren't there. You're here. So where are you shrinking yourself? And then I just get quiet. And it doesn't mean that the person right there has this crazy epiphany and they go, oh my gosh, thank you so much. It's this. One of the things that I hear the most often after I have a coaching conversation is this. Oh, dang. I just actually never thought about that before. That's my job as a coach, I think. People perceive coaching as telling them what to do. Nope. I'm trying to just ask them stuff that nobody's asked them so they think about things and they can figure it out for themselves. <laughs> well, and that's been my experience. It's, it's, it's just the question itself, usually, that makes you stop and typically think about something like that for the first time. And then it forces you to think about the situation differently, to think about the role that you play in the situation differently, maybe for the first time. And all of a sudden, when you're asked a different question, you start coming up with some different answers than you've always come up with. And that in and of itself is a very powerful thing. And a lot of it comes back, like as far as how effective it can be, it comes back to the unspoken pieces of the exchange you know like it's probably harder to ex fully experience me through audio but i tend to be a person who's really open like i i'm sure there's still elements of judgment in me but i think people usually sense like oh man i can actually like tell this guy the truth that makes it a lot more fruitful when you've got you're able to create a space where the person is actually like feeling zero threat or very very low threat and they, they, they're like, okay, I can actually be quiet for a second, think about this, and come forth with something that maybe I've never even voiced before. Yeah. And we were having a conversation with a group of friends the other day, and a friend of ours, she voiced something. And it just struck me, and obviously Chad's such a good listener that I think it also kind of pinged him. And she said it, and it felt so vulnerable and so real. And I go, how many times have you said that out loud? And she had that moment where she's like, wow, uh, I don't know, may maybe one. I so like just get getting to the point where someone feels comfortable sharing is such a massive, it might be like 80% of this whole thing. Yeah. 
and then asking the right questions to make people think. There's one other thing that I want to bring up that has been really powerful around. So like we talked about someone coming to see me or coming to any, any coach or any guide. Oh man, I, I know what I don't want. I know I'm having some issues, but I don't exactly know where I want to go. This is kind of back to the whole idea between navigation and being. I try my best at the beginning of a relationship with someone to get them to view the way they're navigating their life through a, a shifted perspective. So what we're naturally trained to do, like as little kids, we're trained to know what are the sort of masculine things, and I don't mean this by like man or woman, but what are the like what are the actions we're gonna do in life? Like your your third grade teacher says, Hey Chad, what do you want what do you want to be doing when you grow up or whatever, right? And it's like I want to be a professional what? soccer player. Boom. <laughs> I want to be an astronaut. I just missed the mark a little bit. (laughs) So, you know, those are all these like labels that we hold. What I really wish we would ask instead is like, who do you want to become as a person? What are the traits that you want to embody? Uh, And and getting, getting kids to understand that, getting adults to understand that that's actually what our soul is after is fully actualizing into that being that is of, of great service to their community as a whole. So somebody comes to me and they say, Hey, I'm trying to, Oh, can we use you as an example? Please. Okay. So Chad, when we first started doing coaching together, this podcast was an idea that was eating at him constantly because he knew he had the ability to be great at it, but he just wasn't doing it yet because there's probably a lot of fear of judgment. I'm not going to you know, try to like assign what, what you were feeling at the time. But I said, okay, let's do this. Obviously the podcast is a thing that you want to do. What if we looked at your life from the lens of who is Chad trying to become? What are the qualities that you want associated with your name? And he, I think he can't, I mean, you could even tell me if you were like qualities that you want to be known for. Yeah. Well, it was, uh, you know, I want to be someone who is thoughtful, someone who puts meaning into the world, someone who is uh, caring, a good listener. Um, that's what I wanted to become yeah. and wanted to be known as. And like you said, I, I had this recurring feeling, longing urge that I wanted to create something. And then all the fears and all the that little voice would just jump in that would give all these reasons why that wasn't a good idea. Mm-hmm. Thanks, ego. Damn ego. <laughs> So he's got, he's got this, this vision for himself, but what I said is, what if we thought of the podcast as less the thing you're focusing on? What if that becomes a, a sandbox that you get to play in that's going to help you create that version of yourself that you're envisioning? And I find when I speak to people in that frame, they start to feel less fear around doing the thing because they, they, they put more weight into becoming the person and less weight into doing the thing. And I think that's important because if there's a little bit less weight into doing the thing, the fear is naturally going to subside a little bit and maybe give us the window we need to step into it. So the more you start to embrace that shifted perspective, you know, again, a lot of us are thinking, well, I want to accomplish this, this, and this, and then maybe hopefully that will mean that I have these qualities. It's no. I want to have these qualities and I think therefore I'm going to put myself in these situations and accomplish these things because I think it's going, to, it's going to get me there. Another important part of that process for me was I want to bring people into this. By the way, Nate and I speak in fluent metaphors. <laughs> well, it's not, not always fluent. <laughs> sort of semi-fluent. kind of. We get fl- lost in them a lot. Uh, we, we like speaking to each other in metaphors. I think it helps us uh, make sense of these sort of nebulous things that we're trying to approach and trying to understand uh one of the the things that we worked on very early on and has been a continuous thing that we've worked on is this idea of of making an operating system update and i've shared this with a couple people on the show before but now that you're here let's talk through it a little bit more of like what that means because it it was a big breakthrough for me in that in order for me to start maybe making some different decisions around the things that I wanted to create, the person I wanted to be and wanted to become, first it started with the awareness of the values and the kinds of things that I wanted to, you know, represent in the world or who I wanted to become. And then we had to take a look at, well, what are some of the belief systems 
that I currently have. And where do we need to make some updates to that operating system? The operating system being, you know, these are the belief systems and the thoughts that I'm using to operate day to day in my life. I'm thinking about this. And so I'm going to make this decision because this is the way that I function. This is the way that I I operate in my life. And we looked at that and we had to, A, define it. What is the current operating system? And then you had me sort of dream and think of, well, if you could make some updates to that, what would the new one look like? Yeah. One thing we have to do is understand uh, the reason I like operating system is because like we're all familiar with how many uh, updates all of our stuff needs <laughs> constantly, right? Um, w- in a more juvenile version of Nate, I just thought like there was kind of like two chapters, like, okay, it's who I am now and who I want to be. And I got to get there. And then what happens is inevitably you figure out a way to get there and you go, oh shit, there's like other stuff. <laughs> and it just keeps happening over and over and over and over again. So I like the idea of operating system because there's that um, perpetual, oh, someone just crashed on a bike next to us. <laughs> there's that perpetual, should I, should I just pause for a second while they go by? That's okay. okay. Hello. <laughs> Pretty good. Everybody okay? <laughs> that was awesome. You okay? <laughs> I feel like we should like interview these bikers now. <laughs> Tell us about what happened there. <laughs> uh, oh yeah, I mean in so, in some way, in some way you'll be at least audio, they'll be like ah! Here you go. Tell us what you learned from that experience. <laughs> <laughs> it is. I can probably keep going if that's okay. Or is it, is, is yeah. it with the audio? It'll probably pick up their audio. Yeah. Hey, be safe out there. Have a good ride. Anyway, so we had an uh, eventful <laughs> moment there so, with some with some mountain bikers. When you're going to be in nature, you never know how what's going to come. That was that was wild. Like, yeah, yeah, a guy took a big spill. So, um, and hopefully he doesn't perpetually fall down the hill in the same way that I'm talking about perpetually updating ourselves in the operating system. Maybe he needs to make some operating system <laughs> updates. So, yeah. So that's the first part I like about it is that it's ongoing. The other part is what I talked about earlier, where it's like, where do we want to go? What's in the way? Being able to assess ourselves and figure out what our, you know, we are, I like to think of it. That's why I say operating system. We are like this program that's constantly learning and updating. So what parts of it are serving us in going where we want to go? And then where are there areas where we might have some broken code that is that is kind of getting us caught up? So it's just, I think it, it helps get the point across uh, easier than just saying continual growth or, I don't know, for some reason it, we started talking about it and it just stuck and now it's like second nature to us. The, the last part of it that, maybe is most impactful for me is that when you think about making a software update on your computer or on your phone, there has to be one moment where you push a button (laughs) or tap a button that initiates the update. So there is a split second where before that second, you are running the old operating system and then you push the button. And then the second after that, or likely, you know, the hour or two after it, downloads and Mm -hmm. updates and all that installs and all that stuff now you're running a new operating system that to me is maybe the most powerful thing about this whole not the most powerful but that that's what meant uh, maybe maybe the most to me Mm -hmm. because I, i think so often we think about well i want to become this type of person i want to do x and we just kind of think like, well, someday I'll do that. Or especially when we're talking about who, who do I want to become? It's kind of like, well, I don't know. When do I start becoming that person out of fear that people are going to perceive me differently? People are used to me showing up a certain way. And so it's kind of like this, this question of, well, when do I just make this change? And that's why I love the operating system ideas. Cause it's like, well, you just have to decide. And one day you just have to push the button and say, all right, I have a new operating system now. Yeah. And, and that, I don't know, that felt very concrete and kind of brought it home to me of like, especially when we're talking about these more kind of nebulous things where you're not creating something tangible, you're changing elements of who you are and what you align to. And it just takes a split second decision. All that unseen work is so powerful. Yeah. And uh, it, obviously once you push the button, 
in in real life when we're using this, the old patterns are still going to emerge. But I think it does go back to intention, where you have decided to take some kind of an action that indicates that your intention is updated. So like, let's actually make it a real example. Like we talked about the unknown earlier. You and I have talked about this in, in our sessions. I would ask Chad a question, you know, we'd, we'd kind of understand like, oh, we're coming up against some new unknown territory. Hey, Chad, real quick, tell me, uh, what was your, what, what's, what's the operating system we're updating around unknown? Like what was your old OS around unknown? And then he would tell me. Which was that the unknown was <clears throat> scary. The unknown was negative. The unknown, you know, a lot of fear around the unknown was going to lead to potential negative consequences. I was very focused on the negative side of the unknown. That's what kept me stuck. Right. And so then the next question is just, great. Uh, what, what's your intention? What do you want your new operating system? How do you want it to relate to the unknown? And then it was. The thing for me was, you know, flipping from assuming a negative to thinking about the idea of possibility. Like, well, what, why can't the unknown have positive to it? Why couldn't the unknown unlock different possibilities that you couldn't even think of or imagine were possible. And to signify the operating system update, you had to encourage me to like, well, what if you do something, you know, physical to kind of <laughs> it, it, like showcase that you're making this update. You're 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 transitioning from the old operating system and, and you're making an update here. And uh so to do that, I went, I remember the day, uh, and it was it was a pretty cold, it was like probably 40 degrees it was rainy in northern michigan and i went in i jumped in lake michigan Mm -hmm. with the intention that like i'm i'm going in to kind of cleanse this relationship to the unknown and to redefine it to make an operating system update i share that with with you the listener because i think i have found it to be profound and impactful to tie some kind of some kind of action to some of these updates that we're talking about so that you can make it feel a little bit more real or a little bit more tangible and you're bringing i don't know you're you're actually bringing the physical element of your body into some of these more emotional updates that you're making that helped just solidify it for me there's something about that that physical experience that really does i mean it it makes it more visceral it makes it more real that's one of the reasons i'm i love the breath work practice is you go in you have this conversation with yourself and it is accompanied by these real, you know, I actually think I talked to you, we did breathwork the other day, and I said, well, knowing, the deep, intense knowing is actually feeling. So, yeah, if we're going to, it's just a fun little thing to do, too. It's like ceremonial. We also lack ceremonial practices, like, in our modern day. And, I, and I'm not saying I moved to Sedona and I... I only wear robes now and all that stuff. But if you really do think about it, you know, things like rites of passage, uh, there's just, there's not as much ceremony around our life experience. And I think if we can find ways to insert that, it can be very powerful and very catalyzing and also cold if you're jumping into Lake Michigan. Yeah. It's kind of funny to think about, you think about some of these different cultures that have had these ceremonies and these rites of rites of passage for so long. It's like they were living this operating system metaphor long before the, the technology even existed. But it, that was like a, it feels like a way to signify and conduct that, okay, this person has reached a stage in their life where they are now becoming an adult. They are becoming whatever it may be. They're transforming into something new. And we're going to use an actual ceremony and experience to make this thing real. And so maybe we can... If, if those things don't exist in our society or in our families or in our friendships or the circles that we roll in, then create your own ceremony. How, how fun is that? At first, there's the unknown of, well, what would I do? And then there's the, oh, what could I do? You know, so th- those, that's also just little things that you can do to practice relationship with things like the unknown and fear and trying new things is, is just, uh, there's no wrong answer. This thing you said in our, in our breathwork ceremony that we had a few days ago, and I'll talk a little bit more about that, but the first thing I want to talk about is um, knowing is a feeling. Mm-hmm. It really stood out to me when you said that, specifically because you know I've shared quite often on the show, but it, it made me think about how growing up, 
I don't know exactly where I got this messaging from, but I, I, I can I can distinctly think of and remember the phrase. Um, don't make an emotional decision. Mm. Was a phrase that I I feel like I, I heard a lot. Don't make an emotional decision, which led me to believe we don't make decisions with feeling. We make decisions with logic. We make decisions by thinking about them. That's how we make proper decisions. That's how we make right decisions. So when, when I heard you say in the ceremony that knowing is a feeling, that kind of reinforced this journey that I've been on to explore what's this feeling thing about? <laughs> and, and what kind of value could that play in my life? I guess tell, tell me more about that saying that that knowing is a feeling well let's talk about your the saying you said before don't make an emotional decision i believe i don't know if there's actually some sort of devious plan behind it but i believe that our life experience is one that leads us to a place of disconnection from ourselves and from our intuition and you ask me like the kind of people that I end up working with a lot. And that's oftentimes the thing that's the missing piece for them to heal that solar plexus area, which is, if you don't see me on cameras around your diaphragm is you got to get back in touch with what it feels like to trust yourself. You know, there's so many things that we can, even if you just listen to people, listen to someone speak, watch their body, Watch the energy, feel the energy coming off of them. You can tell when the person is speaking from a place of, I read a book about this knowledge, which again, I'm not against, but there's a difference between that energetically and someone who has lived it. There's something incredibly powerful about that. And I tend to, just myself, tend to gravitate more towards the person who has lived it because I think it's a much more rich experience. I think that there's a lot more attached to it than just understanding a concept inside the mind. But like, how do you speak to someone about this if they're sitting on the other end of our microphones right now going, what the hell is he talking about? That's one of the reasons I started the breathwork uh, journey is I was wondering myself that, you know, as I'm sitting here in these coaching conversations with people, I kind of have a hunch of where they need to go. But again, as a coach, you don't want to be trying to get, lead them anywhere. I'm like, well, how can I get them into concert with themselves? I got to somehow remove all these layers of external voices. And I just need them to be able to understand what's coming from inside. Then I got invited to go to this breathwork thing and it happened to me. <laughs> that very thing happened to me. I did not expect it. I wasn't seeking it out. I just was invited. I showed up. And I had a profound experience where I got to go deep within and just talk to pure Nate. Boom. Intuition is now back online. So it is a great challenge for us to find and reconnect with our intuition. But to me, it's one of the best uses of our time and attention is to, is to get back into concert with that thing. I actually think that's where ease comes from. Like when we can actually go with what feels right. You, you end up attracting things at a much more rapid rate. Like ever since I sh said yes to coming to Sedona, so many synchronicities have unfolded, even including the way that I ended up in the training for that breath work. I don't know if we have time for that story. Do you think we do? <laughs> okay. So I get invited to go to this, this breath work ceremony with a practitioner here in Sedona. Her name is Anahata Ananda. I didn't know anything about Anahata. A friend told us about it and we just, Renee and I were like, oh, all right, new experience. We'll see what this is all about. We show up for this thing and Anahata is a very, very skilled practitioner and she has got such a vast range. She's got like this no bullshit shamanic range and then she also got this very tender, loving, motherly range and so I get into ceremony with her. She walks us through how all the breath work's going to go. I won't go too in depth with that other than to, other than to say, I actually released some 
really traumatic experiences I had when I was a child in this ceremony. So by the end of it, I'm a believer. <laughs> you know, I that happens, and then uh, and then you know, uh, there's a portion of the breath work where you're we're just feeling so light, and you're back in touch with just the pureness and the light I talked about earlier. So at the end, she goes, "Hey, if if this impacted you, and you you for whatever reason feel like a calling to this kind of work, I'm doing a training this winter." for um, facilitators and nothing, no action for you guys to take right now, but just let it, let it sink in. So we leave and kind of like highlighted that in my mind a little bit, like, yeah, that seems like something I kind of want to do. Remember I was starting down this coaching path. I knew I wanted to help people. Months go by and daily, this is what usually happens with like our subconscious is like, it's there, it's there constantly, but not really like in the forefront of our mind. Daily, I'm thinking about that. Like, am I supposed to go? Am I supposed to do this training with her and do this breathwork stuff? Uh, and uh, about two and a half months later, I think it was Renee, Renee and I went on a hike to our favorite hike here in Sedona. We're only a couple miles away now to Bear Mountain. It's a very seldomly hiked trail because it's pretty darn steep and it's kind of off the the beaten path. It's a tough one, so we don't see many people when we're out there. We go do this hike. We're at the top. We end up talking about this breathwork experience, and I'm like, man, I. It was so profound. I got so many messages from myself about like what I needed to be doing. And it just, I think I might want to like show this to other people. I think I want to do this training. And we talked about it for a second. And he's like, yeah, I could see that. And as we were heading back down the mountain, I started thinking, I'm like, oh, Nate, you haven't had any like synchronicities in a while. I wish, I wish the universe would give you like a nod that you're supposed to go do this training. And then I just went about the rest of the hike. We're getting back down to like the, the final 10 minutes or so of the hike. We can now like see the car again. You know that feeling. <laughs> there you go. We're about to go eat lunch. And uh, we see one other person coming up the trail. And as they come further into focus, uh, I started to like tear up because the person that was coming up the other way on the trail was Anahata Ananda, the woman who had made a profound impact on me in her breathwork ceremony. So by the time she was even with me on the trail, (laughs) I had already decided, you know, talking about the software update, boom, nod comes in from the universe loud and clear. Hey, there's the teacher. So she's standing there. I'm like, Hey, Anahata, I'm Nate. I was in your breathwork this summer and I'm going to come to do your winter training. And she's like, Whoa, okay. (laughs) That sounds good. (laughs) But, uh, yeah. So like, that's just an example though, of like the way when you listen to the voice And I'm not going to sit here and tell you it's going to happen the next week or the next month. But when you listen to the voice, you start to notice the signs that you're on the right track. And I found breathwork to be one of the many ways that you can get more in touch with that voice. Can you explain to me, someone listening, who maybe is not, is kind of like, okay, I've heard of this breathwork thing i've heard people talk about this maybe i don't really understand what it is you have a great way of just kind of explaining to people and and, and inviting people into something um explain kind of what what breath work is and, and why you find it to be such a profound thing when people ask me about it the first thing that i usually do is i try to just like ease away any of the fears around it the biggest one i've noticed is people are just worried they're going to do it wrong and that was something that I really loved. Even my very first session when I went to and met Anahata at hers is she, she said something along the lines of like, okay, guys, let's talk about this really complicated breathing pattern. So basically what we're going to do is uh, we're going to breathe a lot. <laughs> and I'm sitting there like, I can do that, <laughs> you know? And that's the thing though, is like that, see, that's when we get back into like our thinking mind and out of our being. So we're trying to navigate it and we're not being. so. It's so simple. All you have to do is breathe. Is there a pace? Sure. But I've found there's, there's been times when I go into a ceremony, even when I've been directed by either myself or spoken with Anahata beforehand, like, hey, you don't need to be the strongest breather in the room today. Soften. Slow down. See what comes in. And I have a profound experience there too. So like, that's the first thing I talk to people about is just the breath will take you where you need to go today. And the great thing about it is you're not going to miss out because guess what? You have access to it anytime and it's free. (laughs) So 
the other part of it, as far as the sort, so that's sort of like to dampen down the fears around it. The other part of the fear, I guess, is just, well, I'm not sure what's going to come up. That's where you have to understand that you're, you need to put yourself in a safe environment where you feel like you can be held the right way. That's up to you. Find an environment where you feel like the space created is a safe one. On the other side of some of those fears, though, is <laughs> tremendous insights. Like, I don't know if I want to speak for uh, anyone. I guess if I don't use names. So we had a ceremony the other day. And um, one, of the, one of the people in our ceremony had this tremendous vision. And she's about to undergo this, this huge experience in her life where she's going on this voyage. And she saw herself as a horse and just this powerful being charging along this path, you know, and there's like almost music. It's almost like this cinematic experience of like, for her, it was that knowing like, you have the strength to get through this thing. So it can, it can take us into these very, like, I would almost say borderline, borderline psychedelic places. Because I've had experiences with psilocybin before that, that are somewhat similar, where it's like you're being shown an insight in a visual way, in a, in a narrative-driven way that really helps to like make something sink in. So for people that are feeling a little lost or they're feeling like, I don't really know where to start, or I just think breathwork is such an accessible thing. For most people, it's not as scary as going straight into going, you know, and whether you're going to do some kind of like mushroom journey or ayahuasca, um, it's just your breath. But as you found out, <laughs> there is, you know, there, there are, there are other experiences that you can have. So like if you, if you go into the space and you, and you breathe hard for long enough, you, your body can stiffen up. It's called tetany. So you can get you know, like your hands will start to stiffen up. Um, you, you'll even feel like your mouth will stiffen up a little bit. You can make it go away. You just have to slow down your breath. And the reason that I referenced Chad is he, so before, can I just tell him what your uh, intention <laughs> yeah, was? Yeah. So his intention moving into it was surrendering. And just this kind of goes back to almost like OS. The way that he was thinking of surrendering is, well, I'm going to control everything I can about this experience. And then I, how, whatever comes of it, I'll accept. Meaning like he tried pretty darn hard on that breathing. <laughs> And it, it's breathing hard. It, yeah. So it took him into a very fit, like he had a very physical experience, um, went into the tetany. Now the thing that was very also like noticeable is that you felt safe during that time. And I'm yeah. sure you still had some insights come in, but, um, yeah, it's just, uh, to me, it's a great gateway into getting more in concert with yourself. Mm. That's a good summary and way to describe it i probably should have just said that first <laughs> <laughs> no, the additional context is good <laughs> well and it's just amazing to me how the breath can be that thing you know it, it can unlock these doors so that you can receive some of these messages so that you can get more in concert with yourself all just by breathing that's yeah. it well i mean we run on that we run on air so you got to think about it when you hyper oxygenate, you're, you're going to have, you know, your cells are going to start sweeping out some of the, some of the debris that maybe isn't supposed to be in there. And then in the more metaphorical realm, you can maybe move out some of the emotions that are stuck or, or feeling dense. And then you can also connect to that higher part of your consciousness that sometimes we're closed off to. So the thing I love to tell people is just like, if you, if you're curious about it, I invite you to do whatever is necessary to have the courage to try. Mm. And that's like my new way of just challenging someone. <laughs> it's a very gentle yeah. challenge. I invite you to just get, o get over with it and do it. <laughs> just figure it out. Yeah. Well, it, it, was, it was a great experience and it's been a fun journey for me to just think about you know me five years ago and to think that you and i would be sitting here in sedona talking about a breathwork ceremony that you just <laughs> led me through three days ago is is kind of mind-blowing i mean I, I i wouldn't have been able to wrap my head around that at the time and you know i i thank you for introducing me to a lot of these different things and i just continue to find that like if we can if we can explore these different ways that we can explore ourselves mm -hmm. 
and, and try to learn more about ourselves and get more insights into our own lives and, and, and what this human experience is and can be. It's like, I don't know, I guess I find myself very drawn to that. So I, I thought it was a great experience. And I guess uh, you, the listener, if you just find yourself drawn to wanting to explore more or learn more kind of about yourself, then yeah, I, I give, I encourage you to take the same Maybe mine will be a little more direct than, than Nate's because I'm not the <laughs> practitioner, but go try something like breath work and, and see what kind of experience that has for you. I've, I've found these sorts of things to be very profound for me. And I just want to say thank you for introducing me to some of this stuff because, you know, I don't know if I would have found it otherwise. You got to find someone that you can trust and respect and then you become a little bit more open to exploring some of these different things. Yeah. And it's been so fun to like be by your side while you're going through some of these things. And, uh, you know, I'm not in terms of discovering some of them, it's not as if I'm years ahead of you in that discovery. I tend to, you know, experience a thing and then I get all excited about it and I start spouting off about it. And then you're <laughs> you gotta open, try this. Yeah. And then you're open enough to, to do that. One of the things I'm so passionate about is making the idea of exploration, self exploration fun. I just started recently when I onboard new clients, I have a whole section when we're doing like our first call around fun and laughter and comedy and like the way that those are ways to reflect. So often we think of it as heavy work and I'm guilty of this too. I spent the last four or five years of my life, even listen to the last podcast I did with Chad, I can feel myself in a different vibration now. The last one I was, it, it felt heavy to me. This one feels light. And I just think we're probably going to be more likely to be willing to do the exploration if we understand that it can be fun. And it's been fun for me. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I've been having fun, but I think you're right. We often associate inner work with, Ugh. oh, I've got to, I've got to unearth trauma and I've got to revisit all these dark parts of me or unknown, negative unknown. I'm going into the unknown and I'm afraid of what sorts of bad things are going to come up or I'm going to learn about myself. Those could be part of the experience. Yeah. But what if there's also, maybe you're, you'll get some insights that are positive. I'm throwing up air quotes. Yeah. No, yeah. Um, it's it's but, an but and. You'll get some different insights about yourself and then maybe, or maybe learning about yourself in some of the negative, again, air quotes, some of the parts of yourself that might be more dark, some of the trauma that you've gone through. Not that that's a fun experience in and of itself, but I've learned that exploring some of those parts and then creating a deeper understanding can, in the end, make it kind of a fun experience of like, oh, you know, I can have a new and different relationship with that thing mm -hmm. than I had before. And that's fun. Yeah, it's like I was saying, it's like a, it's a yes and. Like, yes, you may unearth some of those things. And... uh there's all this possibility there that you just haven't seen yet. That could be delightful. Like, are you familiar with the whole yes and in improv comedy where like there's the, you, you join the improv troupe and then they do the exercise where it's whatever the, whatever the concept is. And then you're, you're, you're to sort of add your own thing to it. So it's, yep. yes, this is a scenario and this, and, uh, that speaks to me. And I like to think of life like that. Like, oh yeah, we're all out here just doing this big improv show and we can make meaning out of it however we want and that can be a lot of fun well that might be a good bow on this conversation this was sun's getting low this was a big uh improv show that we just recorded yeah uh, let's just look at cathedral rock for a second whoa so at this point the sun has almost gone down and uh but it, it hasn't fully gone behind the mountains behind us and it's just hitting the rocks behind us i mean they're Perfectly. all practically glowing red uh some folks are walking by um for people who didn't listen to the first episode, where can people find out more about you and all the stuff that we're talking about today? Um, probably the fastest way would be Instagram at getting there, Nate. Trying to think of what other ways they can get a hold of me. <laughs> I think that's just the best That's like answer. the easiest thing. Just go to Instagram, <laughs> look for getting there, Nate. And, uh, the guy that just walked by had such a cool jacket on it. Kind of distracted me. <laughs> it was an old school surf style jacket. This has been a fun experience. Uh, first time recording in a public setting. 
So we had some we had some hikers walk by, some families. We had a, a guy take a tumble on his mountain bike, <laughs> uh, all while having a meaningful conversation sitting in front of the Red Rocks in Sedona. This will be a moment I will never forget. Oh my goodness, this has been so fun! And like I told Chad when we were driving over here, I've been thinking about doing this, uh, having this experience with Chad today for months and months and months. And then when now that it was here, I was really doing my best to just soak it in and. At the, as the whole conversation unfolded, as the mountain biker took the tumble, yes, he's okay. I'm just like, gosh, this is so cool. And that's what I'm leaving the conversation with is just immense gratitude that we got to do this. Same, man. Yes. And we'll do it again sometime in the future. Yes. Please. This conversation was just so fun. I mean, Nate and I have these types of conversations all the time in nature is often where we like to have them whether it's jumping in a river or climbing something or going on some sort of hike so it was awesome to tie th- those elements of what we already do into recording a podcast i mean it just it felt so right to be sitting out on a beautiful evening in sedona in front of the red rocks recording a podcast together i love the experience it, it reminds me of why i i I really enjoy sitting face to face with someone and being able to have a conversation with them. There's just an energy that's difficult to capture virtually. There's so many themes in this episode that of course are related to my life as we talk about some of the things that I've gone through in my coaching with Nate. This idea of the operating systems is one that I'm curious to hear what you think about it because it made a huge difference for me, especially this idea that like there just has to come a moment where we flip a switch and we decide that we're going to become someone new or we're going to operate differently. And that unlocked all of these different ways of thinking. And, and when, I'm, when I'm thinking about, you know, oh, well, maybe someday I'll do that. Or when is the right time for me to become this type of person or to show up differently? This idea of the operating systems and just clicking a button help bring this new perspective around these changes and updates that we want to make to ourselves and our lives. So I'm curious to hear about your thoughts on this idea of operating systems. That is this week's question of the week. So if you head to Instagram at Chad M. Miles or at a level deeper, you can connect with me and other listeners and share some of your thoughts on the question of the week. But this week's question is, what are the beliefs that your current operating system is running on? And based on that, what OS updates do you plan to make? I found it to be a super helpful exercise. So take some time this week to think about what are those beliefs that you're operating on right now and what kind of updates do you want to make to it? We'd love to hear some of your thoughts on any revelations that you have from this experience. Again, you can find me on Instagram at Chad M. Miles or connect with the show at a level deeper. If you want to email me personally, my email is Chad M. Miles at live, L-I-V-E.com. We'd love to hear from you and I will see you next Tuesday.